Thank you for tuning in to Hacks and Hobbies with your host, Junaid. In season two of Hacks and Hobbies, we're visited by our amazing guests coming from all walks of life who want to learn their story, their struggles, and their journey on how they got to where they are today. So stick around. In this episode, we get to speak with Tony J. Salami. He's a visionary, philanthropist, a cognition expert, an international speaker, filmmaker, business coach, educator, and an internationally published award-winning author. He made it really easy for me to come up with those words because his website is so very well maintained and up-to-date. All right, I've heard a lot about Tony J. Salami. He actually wrote the foreword for Magnetic Entrepreneur uh, book series. And I heard a lot about him through Robert J. Moore. And I was like, you know, how can I get in touch with Tony J. Salamian? And luckily, um, I was in the same network with Tyler Wagner, uh, his Authors Unite uh, platform. And I got to speak with Tony and he's like, you know, I'd love to be uh, on your podcast. So Tony, thank you so much for taking the time and coming on to the podcast. Junaid, thank you so much. And also thank you to Robert and Tyler, who also interviewed me for his podcast. So it's a, a great honor to be of service and help many more people out there to follow their bliss. Awesome. I love that. The following the bliss part, right? That's, that's, the, that's the thing that we all take for granted, but then those who take it to the next level by taking that first step, like you mentioned, you know, take the first step, the next step comes right after is, is super, super, uh, super important. So Tony, tell me, tell us a version of your journey that no one's heard of before. Uh, you know, from your website, you, you, you go from homeless to Hollywood, you know, the journey that you've taken, um, through time, it's taken you to so many different places and you've created this um, path in life for yourself that you're able to take on any challenges, take on any opportunities that you want to because of the struggle that you went through and because of the choices we made through life and came up on top. So tell us a version of, of your journey that no one's heard of before. Well, one thing I would love to share with your audience, it's the fact that um, when we feel at the lowest in our life, and for me, I will take just mo one moment of the many experiences where I've felt the lowest, mm -hmm. it's we tend to lose hope. Yeah. Uh, we tend to lose self-worthiness we tend to lose our self-esteem. Uh, we tend to lose belief in anything bigger than ourselves, whether mm -hmm. it's God, the universe, energy. We tend to lose belief in other people that they can help us. We mm -hmm. simply go in this uh, dark ocean at the depth of a huge ocean mm -hmm. where the pressure is so big and there's no light around you. Yeah. And that pressure can turn any human being into vicious uh, person who goes out there and becomes maybe a terrorist, mm -hmm. or it can actually uh, turn that into almost this poison that poisons our light, our love, and our experiences and our skills, and makes us crumble and makes us suffer and makes us ultimately become ill. And potentially, most people end up in suicide. Mm -hmm. So I'm just taking you in that moment in my life where I was homeless on the streets of London, uh, where basically um, following a civil war and following losing friends, family, my identity, everything that I ever knew about my life. And being a teenager, uh, 19 years old, homeless kid on the streets of London, observing this reality where everything seemed perfect. Yet, I just left a reality where everything was crumbling in front of my eyes and where guns and snipers were shooting at innocent people and everything was collapsing. Mm -hmm. 
Wow. So it really made me question life. It made me think about what is it about our human nature that makes us those vicious people or makes us think that we are better than other people and therefore yeah. gives us this uh, false positive of we have the right to go and inflict pain on other people or make them feel like they're not worthy of living, they're not yeah. worthy of being, they're not worthy of contribution, they're not worthy of uh, you know, just uh, liberating themselves and being free with themselves. And then you see other people, on the other hand, being this homeless kid in London, watching the passers-by while I'm crying and grieving, going on with their life like I never existed, like yeah. I never mattered to them. And yeah. there are so many people out there in the world that they had the same feeling, whether you're being homeless or, frankly, you could be in an office, which I later discovered is the same. Yeah. Or you could be with friends, or you could be in your own family, or you could be in a relationship. Yeah. And you still have those similar feelings. So this is really something that went on in my head for almost four and a half months, uh, being mm -hmm. homeless and reading books and surviving on just one slice of bread and water. Yeah. And trying to really see what is it my role in this chaos to create an order and to create a service that I can help other people going around the world and help them really transform their lives. Mm -hmm. But my first step was really how to get myself from that state into what we, most people take for granted, a normal life, which is to have a shower, to have the basic amenities for yourself, to have a yeah. roof over your head, to have maybe an education, maybe a school, maybe a friend, maybe uh, you know, a bed to sleep. Hmm. So once I got those things, I really wanted to really continue learning about science, about biology, about technology, about engineering, about quantum physics, about life, the laws of the universe. And I really became this curious kid that wanted to resolve a lot of problems for mankind. Yeah. Because what I realized during this period, that whatever I'm experiencing, it's what every human being experiences at different times in their life yeah. and in different forms. And this curiosity really led me into investing a lot of time, energy, and money into developing myself. And my first part of my journey was really getting out there in the corporate world and making a name for myself in mm -hmm. running technology programs. And uh, some of them were like billion pounds worth transformational technology programs. Mm -hmm. But one of the main roles was developing people who delivered that. Yeah. And so I could combine my love for psychology and helping people uh, almost like do an upgrade of psychology mm -hmm. to be able to deliver those things and to be able to actually uh, have better productivity, better performance, better energy, and better, I would say, interaction with one another while we are facing challenges. Because the fact of life is we will never, ever, as a human race, not have challenges in, in, in our future as we go forward. Absolutely. But what we can have, it's tools that helps us better overcome those challenges. And we will always have conflict around the world, but what oh, yeah. we can have is again, we can have a way of actually turning that conflict into opportunity, of, into a collaboration and mm -hmm. connectivity. Absolutely. And this thing about separating people and borders and also um, polarizing people's opinions so you can rule over them, was mm -hmm. something that was very close to my heart because I come from a civil war country. Yeah. And this is what I've been seeing around the world wherever I travel, how easily nowadays people can be polarized through media, through what they read, through social media, through main media. And then some people who maybe want to take advantage of that, they mm -hmm. take advantage of that. And then therefore they create not only a, a conflict within wherever they are, yeah. but that conflict spreads globally. So, you know, one action exactly. of one person can actually affect the entire planet. Oh, and yeah. intuitively, we all know Earth is the only home we all share. This is the only one. It's the only That's one. Right. That's right. And we've seen a massive movement with people uh, like we had like a week ago or 10 days ago, something like that, when we had yeah. the climate change movement around the world. Mm -hmm. People are connecting into one uh, philosophy, which is, in their realization, this is our home.
and what kind of home we're going to leave to future generations. It's exactly. a question I would ask any human being in the world mm -hmm. when they do something that maybe consciously or unconsciously will have an impact on the people who will need to live after we are gone. Absolutely. And um, going back to that conversation that the climate change conference that they had, right? That yeah. little girl going up there and talking about, you know, what's going to happen with my kids, with my grandkids? Mm -hmm. What kind of world are we leaving? And um, it's very powerful. You, you're absolutely right. This is the only home that we have. And, you know, I've, I've been seeing some stories out there people are posting and it, it's, it's again happening that thing of um, the, the echo chamber effect where there's people, there's actually an entire organization of people that are coming around to say that um, carbon or carbon dioxide in the, in the atmosphere is actually good for the environment because it's, it's what the, trees breathe in and there's a whole that the, there's a whole team of people I, I, I don't even know what you what you call it but it, there's a whole movement that's against this climate change that you know that is, this is bs which is really again you know it, it it questions their motives like what are their motives why are they pushing this agenda to you know negate of all the things that are actually happening because of this issue? I believe, uh, Junaid, it's everything that's happening globally. It's a necessity and yeah. it's part of the evolution and it's part of us as mankind going to the next yeah. stages of our evolution. Because if we don't have a problem, we don't have a cause. If we don't have a cause, we don't have a problem. And if we really look at the science and if you look at the laws that govern the universe and govern everything that we see, yeah. uh, those conflicting ideas will always exist. They'll just transform into shape and form. So in my belief, it's basically both of them are needed because without one, the other one will never exist. And therefore, as we go through evolution, they will be changing in forms. So maybe currently we have a climate change issues, but as we resolve that, there will be yeah. another issue. And as we resolve that, there'll be another cause. And as we resolve that, and this is all mm -hmm. through, you know, evolution of mankind. And yeah. If you go back and study thousands Different. of years of history, which I have done on many occasions. Mm. You will see the same patterns appearing, but in different forms. And we tend to become very emotional about it. And what I see a lot of my clients and the leaders I work with and um, people who run businesses, who want to be more ethical, who want to promote sustainability, uh, they themselves get caught in the conflict within the self because certain things that we do on a daily basis, while we want to be so righteous about something, the reality is if you go out there and you have to serve a family and you have to serve your children and you have to go to schools and buy a goods to feed your family, I would say about 50% of those goods, they're not ethical, but you're not thinking in the moment that they're not because that current moment in there is your child is needing something from you, whether it's a, a plastic bottle that you feed your child for milk or whether it's a takeaway box that you actually take them to school. But we tend to uh, 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 almost like forget that life, if we look at life, if we had this massive zoom from the universe and watching the planet, yeah. we would not have the perception of luck. Yeah, it's true. Yes, you're, you're very right. And, and so... I've been looking at it from other perspectives also, right? So sure, the information that they're bringing through forward is true because they're saying that, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the farms uh, and greenhouses, they actually install um, carbon dioxide producer generators. So they can generate carbon dioxide inside this, these, um, these greenhouses which doubles production because now it's creating more carbon dioxide or more food essentially for the plants to take in and increasing production, which is a valid point. So when as we actually say, okay, that idea is not good enough yeah. anymore. And yeah. this is how it happens to all of us. Like the things that we used to think they're okay when we're childhood, for instance, a child can go and 
uh, dump something on the street without thinking that it's dangerous. But as an adult, you don't do that. So we forget to uh, allow ourselves for the shifts and the changes we need to do as we go through the ladder of the evolution of self, but also the evolution of a nation, the evolution of the planet. And I believe that all things which supports our values, yes? Emotionally uh, reacting. You cut off again. Okay, so we've been continuing to really, uh, when something supports our values, we tend to jump on it. And when something literally uh, uh, contradicts with our personal values, we tend to judge it. Entire country, yes, I could see the entire country being polarized and emotionally reacting. We have more polarized opinions. Yeah, it's true. And the, the, the bigger those polarized opinions become, the lonelier we become in ourselves. Yeah. Not just with ourselves, but every human being that potentially before we would uh, um, interact and share ideas. So we're going from this connectivity to disconnectivity. Yeah. And the more you're polarized, the more you disconnect. That's uh, the truth of fact of life and of the laws that actually govern nature. That's that's so true. That's so, and 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 yeah. There's, there's no way to, I mean, that's, that's human nature, right? We, we have, and, and I don't even know where to start, but the reason we, the reason all of this is reoccurring over time and time, like you mentioned, is because it is in the human nature, even though we are evolving over time, the basic human nature is still the same from many, many, many years ago or, or decades ago or it's thousands, thousands of years, of years right? It's <laughs> yes, and millions of years. Millions yeah. of years, exactly. You know, it's, nowadays we have more of an awareness of how actually we can um, uh, control how we perceive our reality, but also whether we engage with our primitive or what some people call reptilian brain, or oh, yeah. in the medical field, we would call it the amygdala. Exactly. So basically, there's a way we can actually control our responses. Therefore, we don't overload our body mm -hmm. uh, with information and emotions that potentially uh, turn this use stress, which is healthy for our body, into distress, which becomes destructive to our body. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and what we have to do... Um, and a lot of the times that reptilian brain is responsible for the safety of the person, right? And that kicks in to protect you, essentially. And if you yes, do not... Yes, I mean, I talk about it yeah. in Path to Wisdom, the alarms mm -hmm. that we have. Right? Yeah. The majority of the alarm comes from that inbuilt system which we have. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, we as people have evolved. Yes. Uh, the environment in which we actually operate has evolved. Yes. So instead of actually almost giving an upgrade to this reptilian system, mm -hmm. we actually engage with a downgraded reptilian system in an upgraded environment. Yeah. And that's where the biggest conflict happens for most human beings, wherever I go around the world mm -hmm. and people I work privately with. It's that conflict between your animal nature and your angelic nature yeah so beautiful wow that's some powerful stuff man so every day what what is your daily i mean i know you work with a lot of um people and you know as a coach and as an educator um what is something that keeps you going and i know we've talked a lot about us being aware of where we actually live. I mean, the earth is our home. Being gentle, being kind to people around us is is what's going to get us to the next step. And being being collaborative is more important than being competitive. And I think over time, that's what we've been taught in school. The competition part. You know, you got to be the best or you're a loser, which is, which is such a bad, um, bad way of teaching our young children that, you know, this is how you grow up. 
but I wouldn't say bad, you know, okay. but I would say it's basically when we uh, when we almost like cross the fine line mm. uh, between competition and collaboration, because in our nature again we are competitive. But when we cross that line where that uh, competitiveness becomes a danger to another human being, mm -hmm. that's where the problem is. Because we don't have this self-regulatory system or the emotional intelligence needed to be able to keep that competitive and collaborative nature in equilibrium. Yeah. Because they both are needed. So it's not more one is better, one is worse. Uh, we have all of those traits within ourselves. It's basically as we become wiser within the self, mm -hmm. as we learn those tools, this is why I created a TGSC method alarm nice. for people to use that tool to consistently be able to own their disowned parts, mm -hmm. but in a way that actually becomes of a service to you and to mankind. Nice. I love it. I love it. Man, there's so many things uh, we could just go on and on with, with the information. I mean, and that's why you have the many books that you've written because you've got so much knowledge and from the experience and the, and the research that you've done over the years for these books and, and for creating the, the, e, the TGSE method, man, that's, I'm, I'm just, um, what's that word? <laughs> Flabbergasted. What's, um, So what really, I mean, I, I want to jump into some of the questions that I asked, but who was your first role model that, I mean, you, you had gone through, uh, you know, being homeless and being in that state, but who was your first contact that um, enabled you to see how things could be different? Um, my mom and dad. I mean, mm -hmm. I was born in Macedonia mm -hmm. in a town called Gostivar, mm -hmm. uh, which is northern Macedonia. Mm -hmm. And I grew up in a, a family of restaurateurs and farm owners. Mm -hmm. We had farm land and we had restaurants. And my parents, when they married just after the Second World War, mm -hmm. they had nothing, absolutely nothing. Yeah. So they they built a fortune by serving people, by feeding people, mm. and by caring for people. And by uh, consistently, I mean, I've never had my parents complain about work. Yeah. So, and equally, for instance, I learned to make money at the age of six. I used to sell farm products mm. and milk products uh, from the farm to our local gypsy, Macedonian, and Turkish and Albanian communities. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when I came to England, and as my uh, self-awareness increased, for yeah. instance, in England or in Western countries, they, they see that as a child labor. Mm. And back at home, it's seen as enabling the child to be able to become independent as they grow. So, yeah. you know, sometimes we get on this, um, I would say, self-destructive ego mm -hmm. wagon that we project our own values into another society, which completely out of context. Yeah. And I do not see me working in the farm and my parents teaching me how to serve people and teaching all those amazing skills that now serve me for life as a child labor. Mm. But another parent in a country such as Britain or America, they will see that, oh, your child doesn't have a, a you know, childhood. Mm. So, you know, I see the, the almost the disservice of children in Western countries yeah. where the parent provides everything for them. Mm -hmm. So they don't have any, they don't sweat for what they get. Yeah. So this is, uh, we've created this almost like uh, dependency with our children in Western world where, you know, in, in this, in the name of protecting our children, we're disabling them. Wow. Instead of actually encouraging them to be able to do things like, for instance, if they want pocket money, sure. Here Every you day you wash the dishes mm -hmm. at home, you go and, clean the garden and you go and help a, a disabled neighbor or you, you do some form of service yeah. for that what you want. But a lot of the parents who may have suffered in their lives, they have that psychology, which I've seen because I work with a lot mm -hmm. of parents and conflicts and addictions and all sorts of stuff. They tend to overcompensate by giving children a lot of things without the child even earning it, even being grateful to the very same parents who enable them to have an amazing life. 
you know. So I think the balance of the two is essential for our bringing our children. Absolutely. And, and you, you brought up a really good point about children and raising children and raising that awareness of, you know, you have to earn, you have to earn your um, luxuries. And, and I am myself, you know, um, in that boat where, you know, I'll, I'll provide for my kids from, you know, like, you know, you want, you want to watch TV, here we go. You can watch TV and, um, or you want to go play outside, you know, you can do that or, you know, you want some toys, but you know, we, we give that freedom to them because growing up, we didn't have that many freedoms. And so there's, but then the more I, the more I look at it, I'm like, you know, we need to teach them that, you know, every cause has an effect. If you do something wrong, you're going to get punished or you're going to have a timeout. You're going to have a grounding timeout period. Uh, but anytime you do good or you, you do service or you, you know, take the trash out, you clean your room, make sure you follow the, the things that you're supposed to be doing. You know, when you go to the restroom, you know, make sure you wash your face and brush your teeth. Don't go back and forth after being told uh, this because you want to maximize the amount of time that you have and be efficient as well as being responsible. And it's, it's really hard to get that into their heads because they're going to school and learning different things from their classmates and from what the school system is teaching them. So it's like, Oh, that kid, they can watch TV and play games and be on the iPad. Why can't I do that? Well, we don't run the same kind of family. So those are some of the things that, you know, I talk about, talk to my children about, you know, uh, being, having that responsibility. And, and um, it's really interesting because I had not thought of that um, concept before that, you know, we are actually enabling or we are actually teaching them life lessons instead of um, them, them having to learn it on their own when they're older and having their, this sense of self entitlement. Yes. I mean, in today's generation, uh, wherever I go globally and as I mean, all you have to do is go to a restaurant mm -hmm. and see how many families spend their time being on, on their phones on technology. Yeah. So uh, that connection uh, that is there, that on its own, it's an alarm. Yeah. And an alarm, the fact that how disjointed and disconnected the family is. Yeah. If a family cannot take an hour to be together without any technology, mm -hmm. that on its own, it's a problem. Yeah. Yeah. But most people don't see that as a problem in today's world because they observe others. Mm -hmm. And therefore, it's, it has become almost a standard false positive. Yeah. And, you know, uh, even if you take 15 minutes on that table, mm -hmm just to take some time with your children to be able to connect at a human level and being able to have a meal. Like it's, you know, we become, we've created this new addiction on technology. Yeah. So, you know, uh, you know, when people talk to me about addiction, about drugs and cocaine and all of those things, and I said, what about technology? Yeah. You know, cocaine used to be a, a drug that everybody was scared of. But the reality is every human being on the planet has access to the most powerful drug which is technology. That's right. And we're not educating people generally, whether it's children, family, adults, and everything else, how to consciously use technology in a way that does not create addiction. Because nowadays we even have more people depressed about technology. That's right. You know, I've been hired by parents to look at, to diffuse depression and anxiety. And when I go into the family environment and see some of the conflicts that are happening, it's because those expectations, somebody doesn't have 10,000 likes or 2,000 likes on Instagram mm -hmm. or on, on Twitter. And they become like, uh, I would say, um, depressed and anxious and behave. They have this almost destructive, childish behavior just because they didn't get what they want in that instant moment wow. by some person from another part of the planet who they're expecting to validate mm -hmm. them. So, you know, we're creating all those new psychological issues to children and then we feed them with unnecessary drugs instead of dealing with the real problem behind yeah. them. So there are many aspects of, you know, a family, uh, how the family and the parents can take ownership 
uh, of actually um, creating a safe and healthy environment mm. for the children to grow so they become more sort of self have self regulation and self awareness yeah. to be able to actually uh, have a more of a loving and joyful experience with life outside the home environment and outside of the uh, i would say online life that most children nowadays around the world have created mm -hmm. so if you take a child uh, and you observe their reality online and you take that child and you observe their reality in real life there's massive discrepancies yes in their behavior in their life in what uh, they project outwardly and what's inside inwardly mm -hmm. so this is one of the reasons mm -hmm. i travel around the world and i get hired for different reasons yeah some people it's business, productivity, performance, for other people might be personal issues, family issues, relationship issues, sexual issues, yeah. addiction issues. So this is why I wanted to really, I spent 30 years learning uh, various tools until I found a tool which I created myself. Yeah. Which I thought, okay, since I've upgraded so many uh, networks, technology networks, mm -hmm. and the reality is if you don't have the heart of the business, which is the backend systems to provide the services to front end, mm -hmm. no communication, no business happens in the company and with the customer. So it's that is, is what, I mean, the, the inner world that we have in ourselves, yeah. the business is the inside infrastructure of the business and how all the communication gets passed on and communicated. So I, when I spent 12 weeks in meditation of the tool I wanted to create, mm -hmm. and I created a unique one of a kind tool in the world mm -hmm. and I trademarked that, yeah. I was so, uh, uh, grateful that all of those ideas came together and all my 30 years of experience mm. came, came together into a powerful tool that any human being uh, can actually use. Yeah. And it is what put me on a path to basically bring my work uh, globally and to inspire 1 billion people to use the tool in education, in healthcare, in business, in leadership, in government. So therefore, we can actually all contribute towards the fulfillment of those 17 UN goals. Because I believe we are extremely rich oh, as yeah. A mankind, we just need to think a bit differently to be able to use collaborative and co-creative and I would say inspiring energy to bring it all together and um, maximize the resources that nature gives us and what we give to nature. That's amazing. I love it. I absolutely love it. And the more I think about it, the more it's, it's, it's absolutely needed for the human for for our generation for our future generations because we are handing these devices to young kids you know anywhere from as soon as they can start using a device you know for distraction for uh to take some time away to you know it we just use this device to hand off and be like hey here use this device so i can go do something else instead of uh, using other methods of engaging the child's n nature and th their mind. So how does one see this problem and uh, get away, you know, not get away, but try to learn and enhance their own mind or, or, or their own behavior while they're at it? at lunch or while they're at uh, sitting and eating food? How, do, how does one even take that stand or start in that path? Well, I think there's no one solution for everybody yeah. because our individual value and belief system, culture and environment and social economic situations dictate how people behave. Yeah. So for me, it's about what works for the individual mm -hmm. because, you know, what worked for one of my clients didn't work for the other clients. So therefore, this is why I understood this long time ago when I really devoted my life and dedicated my life to help people. Yeah. But what I could say is for anybody who's listening to this is to look into their own environment. What is the healthy boundaries they perceive uh, that will help them? Uh, first of all, to help, if we're talking specifically about parents, mm -hmm. uh, what is the healthy boundaries they in themselves need to put? Because if a child looks that you don't have healthy boundaries, you're not going to enforce a healthy boundary to a child if the child perceives you, you're not walking the talk. And right. most parents in the world are doing that. Yeah. You know, their children intuitively will know when the parent is lying, mm -hmm. 
when the parent is trying to manipulate, when the parent is trying to control, when the parent is trying to instill fear. Because what most parents are there uh, forget is the fact that child has its own psychology, its own, I would say, growth, its own value system, its own beliefs that they've been developing from the moment they came into this world. Yeah. And we actually develop a lot of emotional stuff and our brain starts developing even in the womb of the parent, of yes. the mother. So a lot of parents forget, most people still think that when the baby is born, baby is blank. Well, <laughs> it's not. There's, no. a lot of, <laughs> uh, there's a lot of evidence, scientific evidence out there that tells you it's not. Yeah. Because when it needs food, it will cry. You know? Exactly. <laughs> Just if you really observe that, you will see that. And it's so beautiful to observe it. So what I would say, it's, uh, the, the first principle that I should share in Path to Wisdom is the principle of present moment awareness. Yeah. So become aware in that moment uh, in which you perceive something that may be destructive or on the other hand, maybe supporting you because when something supports us, we become blinded by the downside of it. Yeah. We just think, oh, this is amazing. But we're not forgetting how that amazing in this case, for instance, okay, let's give a child everything. We're forgetting that by giving everything, they're not gonna learn to appreciate what you've just given them. That's right. So I would say the first thing is to people become present in that moment and see what kind of healthy boundaries or healthy behaviors they want to instill for the reality they want to experience. Because a parent of them, majority of their parents, I do know, they want the best for their children. Yeah. But sometimes it's a conflict because what children perceive to be best for them, it's not necessarily matching what the parent wants. Right. So it's about really understanding those, I would say, value system and how to be able to communicate in each other's value system so there's always a collaboration between and instilling healthy behaviors that child then can use for life to be able to move forward because a lot of people when they you know um, they look at my social media and say oh wow he's a very successful guy mm -hmm. but if they were to read my books about the wisdom hashtag loneliness they will cry yeah. They will cry on what I had to go through in order to do what I do. But also, when I teach my Vital Planning for Elevated Living, which is a five-day like uh, uh, life-optimizing and business experience, mm -hmm. uh, most people see the beautiful pictures of amazing locations. But if you ask my client or you come to the experience, it's 10 to 12 hours intensive work. Somebody like me drilling you for 10 hours about your life problems and the life things that you want to create in your life. Yeah. And then we have moments in the morning for breakfast, for lunch, and for dinner. And only on the sixth day, I get my clients to experience the reward. So meaning five days, I will grill them. I will instill a lot of pain <laughs> while we're doing this work. Yeah. And then they know that on the sixth day, they'll be rewarded. Nice. So, you know, the punishment and reward, it's part of our animalistic nature. It is, and it's yeah. essential for us to have that. Because if we don't, Believe me, we'll be totally out of control. And some people and children are very good at pushing boundaries. Yes. Yeah. In fact, it's nowadays where, as I said, it's sort of uh, those things start uh, with yourself. Yes. So, therefore, when I actually work with clients, uh, we'll be looking at every single area of their life, their business life, their leadership style, uh, uh, you know, or professional, because some people don't run a business. Some people work in the profession. Mm -hmm. And all of those people, all of those behaviors, actually, you know, they show up in every area of your life. Yeah. So therefore, when I help people instill new behaviors and actually bring them into alignment with what's truly valuable to them in that moment in time, yeah. everything changes around them. Everything reshuffles, including the way they communicate with themselves, uh, with their children, with their family, with their partners, with uh, their social network, with the place where they live, uh, what they do, what they work, and the kind of impact they want to make in the world so what i've seen is the more i help my clients yeah. to upgrade the different uh, systems of living and models of reality that they've learned from a very young age yeah. the more those are great the more the experience of life upgrades for them so whether it's like getting better jobs better opportunities better connections mm -hmm. uh, better products to serve more people therefore to receive more money and then to be able to invest that money, whether in investments, whether for their children's education, yeah. better home, it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, you cannot upgrade your lifestyle if you haven't really upgraded your psychology. That's absolutely true. That's absolutely true. And uh, a famous song, you know, Man in the Mirror by Michael Jackson. That's exactly what he's saying. Yes. He's like, change the absolutely. man in the mirror. Exactly. 
yes, change the man in the mirror. But we tend to have this awareness of momentary awareness. We realize that with words and most people, like last night, I went to a very beautiful network mm-hmm. called Birth Rally, which is people, successful people going on a rally with a very expensive cars. So yeah. I do that with my clients, which is a unique experience that I offer. And a few of the people I was sitting down, they kept using the word I know. And then I upgraded their psychology within five minutes when they burst it into tears, where they realize when we tell ourselves I know something, mm-hmm. we're actually shutting down. Ah. If that knowing it's not in alignment mm-hmm. with your reality, you're actually lying to yourself. Yeah. And, you, and your inner being knows that. Therefore, it will shut down because you're not leaving room for you to learn and to grow. Yeah. So just changing the psychology around saying to the person who was sitting in, uh, in me, instead of you keep telling me you know all of those things and there's no evidence of that, how about if you change the language and say, I'm aware of these things? Yeah. And then say, okay, by being aware, I need to do so and so for me to bring that into my reality. Mm. Therefore, I now know it, I now own it, and the reality shows I have it. Yeah. Most people in the personal spiritual development industry in the world are caught up with this idea that they know everything. So what I was saying yeah. is this is where the people around the world, mm-hmm. wherever I go, uh, they keep telling themselves, you know, they've learned something in the seminar or in a book or something like that. Yeah. So I know it. No, but you don't know it. If you're examining the reality, yeah. um, uh, there's no evidence to that. Yeah. And this is where uh, basically, oh, if you ask any of my clients around the world, they know I start crashing those illusions. Mm-hmm. This is one of the things I'm not sure if you know, but with some of my clients, we co partner, we created a film and documentary series called Living My Illusion. Mm-hmm. Where basically, uh, through the transformative, uh, transformational work that they do with me, we put the camera back at them. Yeah. Creating a new trend in the film and documentary series where people, as they go through this work, they can actually use that as a mirror. Mm. So we're teaching those 25 principles through real examples of real people with, in the moment, filming with no scripting. Yeah. When I bring them to the awareness of what's true to them. And you get those tears of inspiration and joy when the human being in themselves realizes the kind of, I would say, the bullshit uh, thing that we tell ourselves. Yeah. But then our being intuitively inside of us knows that we're doing mm-hmm. that but we project this mask to the world which is something i'll be talking about in my upcoming book, book called the path to excellence mm-hmm. the kind of masks that we develop over the period of time yeah. where we're afraid to go back and crush them crush the illusion so the truth can come out our light can come out, yeah. out our love can come out. and when those things start to come up you start to radiate you don't gravitate yeah no, that's beautiful. I love it. That's that's really, really powerful. And and the more aware we are of our surroundings, and like you said, you know, you you even though you're aware, even though you say you know, you don't really know because you haven't walked in those shoes. You haven't experienced the struggles of a parent, of a newborn, um, a, a parent with newborn babies, or or parents with three kids, or parents with four kids. It's 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 very different than just being like, oh, I could I could say it, and that's where the the term of sympathy and empathy comes in, right? You're either sympathetic or empathetic. It's 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 like you have an understanding or an or an awareness, but you can't really be in those shoes unless you've actually traveled that path yourself. The truth, Junaid, is we actually we even don't because, mm-hmm. uh, you know, even I might have an awareness, I might have an awareness of one minute of your life. Yeah. You know, I'm not there 24 hours with you being a parent and what it is like to deal with, uh, with your child. Yeah. So I might observe a moment in your life mm-hmm. where I've seen your children. And that is extremely limited for me to base a decision or to base an action, to base a thought mm-hmm. about somebody who may be a parent. Yeah. I can teach you the psychology. It's up to you what mm-hmm. people do with that. Mm-hmm. But this is what is the same thing when we actually limit ourselves. And this is why I see most of the problems people out there make who struggle financially with their health, with their relationship. It's how limiting their psychology is. Mm-hmm. And once you start really upgrading that, you, you start creating a whole new boundary. And I say to people, when people start doing this work, I said, this is never ending. So when people ask me, how long do I need to work with you? 
my question to them back is that how thirsty are you for wisdom, for life, and for impact yeah. you want to make in the world? And if you have this huge calling, <laughs> it means we'll be working for many years exactly. for to help you really deliver that and really make a big impact and also get what you want. Because, you know, there's always this idea that people are altruistic. No, every human being out there, they do something because they want something in return. Yes, absolutely. And a lot of people are afraid to acknowledge the truth. Because other people might judge them for what they want. Uh, a, a wise person knows how to transform the internal wisdom yeah. into external wealth. Yeah. And when, when people tell me about wealthy people, I say, well, which one do you know? Which one do you know person? Mm -hmm. So I go back and apply those 25 steps in my methodology until they become tearful and grateful. Yeah. The fact that there are there the wealthy people who employ people who be, make a bigger service. Mm -hmm. You know? Let's take Mark Zuckerberg. You know, he is one of the richest, youngest people out there. Wow. But he provided a platform for billions of people to connect. That's amazing. And share all of our pain and all of our greatness and all the things that we perceive. Yeah. But we take that for granted. Nobody is in his shoes managing a big company such as Facebook and being also equally responsible exactly. for anything that happens in Facebook. Yeah. So what I see is people, they want the success, but they do not want the pain that goes with it. Yes. And this is why I also observe in the behavior of many children out there in the world. They want an instant text message, wealth and success mm -hmm. or a relationship without putting the work that somebody puts out there exactly. to really create the steps. And uh, you know, I met many wealthy people out there. Yeah. And all these wealthy people have in common, they provide huge solution for mankind. That's right. So when people ask me how to be wealthy, I said, well, invest in yourself, awaken those states in yourself that know what kind of service you want to bring, yeah. create a product that people want, and go into the world, serve many people. So the more people you serve, the wealthier you become. It's a simple equation. And that is in alignment with laws of fair exchange. Yeah. So, you know, <laughs> uh, nature, nature teaches all of us that. Yes. But we tend to have these skewed perceptions about the relationship we have with nature mm. and nature has with us. Forgetting we are nature. Yes. Forgetting that those relationships are already built within ourselves. We don't have to look outwardly for those. Yeah, we don't. That's that is so true because um when you say, you know, we, we people just see the end product and they want the end product. Like for example, when we go out and buy honey at the store, you know, you, you pay a certain amount and you, you get honey that you can enjoy. But if you look in the back and how much work it goes into creating that honey, collecting that honey, mm -hmm. a single honey, flower to flower. Right. Yeah. A single honeybee can only collect one twelfth of a teaspoon worth of honey in its lifetime. Yep. Right. So um you see the grandness of the entire world just by looking at a tiny insect like a honeybee and what it takes for it to bring this delicious, you know, um, product for us to consume. Wow. Yes. Uh, uh, but what uh, people also forget that in the same product, mm -hmm. Uh, some people could be also allergic and oh, some yeah. people could also die. Absolutely. So this is what we tend to forget. We tend to look at uh, things in life as one-sided. Mm -hmm. This is a perfect example. Yeah. So whether it's success, we see it as one-sided or failure. Yeah. When we go through depression, we see that as a one-sided, that we are at the bottom of it. And this is when I go back and throughout my history of my life and for uh, those people who want to learn about it, mm. by all means, uh, uh, they can read the books and uh, they can, from um, 12 of 12, uh, uh, our documentary I co-created with my clients yeah. um, will be available on Amazon. And that on its own, it's uh, thought provoking. That on its own will challenge many people mm. to sit back and say, where am I lying to myself? Where am I lying to the people I love? Yeah. And bring that awareness so you can have some form of self-correcting mechanism for you to live in your truth. Hmm. Wow, that's very powerful. All right, well, we've had some really awesome conversation. I've, I've learned a lot uh, from these conversations about you and about the psychology uh, of how 
we behave and and I've had several conversations similar to this uh, with other guests that are you know talking about the mind that are, that are that are talking about the different alarm systems and how we perceive things and and it's just a great refresher um, I have some questions towards the end that I ask my guests um, if you're ready yes go for it Janine. awesome what is one hobby that you wish you got into um painting <laughs> and the reason being mm-hmm. when i was a kid i used to do a lot of drawing cartoons and nature and and objects nice and part of me is sort of i always miss that part yeah the creative part of myself but i'm creative in like in writing of people business and products and all of that but painting i would love mm-hmm. to maybe spend i don't know 12 weeks with a, an amazing teacher mm. who does this uh crash course with me and sure. <laughs> opens up for me to be able to paint my work. Yeah. That would be amazing. That would be amazing. That's nice. Um, uh, there's a gentleman who started this movement called Inktober about 10 years ago. Mm-hmm. So every October it's inked. It's basically every day you're, you're using your pen and paper and just drawing something. Oh, wow. He's got some prompts out there. So on the first day, you know, you draw something that, that's related to a ring the next day. So every year he's got a little card that, so if you don't know what you want to draw every day, you can take these prompts and draw based on that. So there's, it's, it's a pretty amazing movement. The whole world is, you know, on inktober.com. Uh, you can check out why he started this and, and it's really cool. It, it, and he, he had a similar thing, like, you know, I want to draw more. So what do I do? You know, well, so he started a challenge and it's been going on for 10 years. Pretty, pretty neat. Uh, <laughs> Thank you for sharing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, next one. What is your favorite movie or TV show? Well, uh, TV show would be Friends <laughs> and nice. Sex in the City. <laughs> uh, book would be, I mean, I, I read thousands of books mm-hmm. and uh, uh, each one of them for me has been uh, amazing. But one of the things that I uh, I loved, uh, especially in the work that I do, it's the On the Origin of Species by Charles Darwin. Nice. It's a very old one. And yeah. It's about the revolution and uh, our basically the theory of evolution yeah. and one of the things that for me it's been a book that instilled in me the hunger for our origins and how to be the best service to mankind nice very beautiful uh, okay what movie would you choose if you got to play a character in it um pretty woman richard gear Nice. Very, very classic and very nice. Very classic yes. movie, yes. Awesome. Um, who is your favorite superhero? Uh, it has to be Superman. Superman. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, last question. If you were a board game, what would it be? Um, wow. Um, if I was a board game, what it would be? Hmm. Maybe um, uh, Monopoly is a good one. I love yeah. Monopoly. Monopoly is really, <laughs> really good. Monopoly is a good one. Yeah. Nice, nice. Well, Tony, thank you so much for taking the time. This was really awesome talking with you. Um, I learned a lot, and I would definitely like to continue conversation, and uh, you know, keep in touch with you, and uh, see when your next book is coming out and, and, you know, learn more of how you got here. Thank you so much, Junaid. And for anybody who's interested, they can go to my website, tonyselimi.com, T-O-N-Y-S-E-L-I-M-I.com. And there are all the links in there, whether it's my work, my books, uh, articles, and connect with me on social media and people want to follow, uh, whether it's on to my uh, public Facebook page or my Twitter account, my Instagram account, my LinkedIn, people can find all the information in there so at least they can start their journey. Awesome. And for those entrepreneurs who want accelerated results, they can check the Vital Planning page. Mm -hmm. It's one of a unique experience for people who really are ready to invest their time, the energy, the money with an expert who can help them really uh, upgrade the psychology for the results and the outcomes in life they want to create. Beautiful. Thanks so much, Tony. We will talk soon. Have a great day. You too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. 
Congratulations, you made it to the end of the episode. Thanks so much for listening to our guest on this episode. Please send me an email at junaid at hacksandhobbies.com to tell me what you loved about our guest today. You could find links mentioned in this episode on the hacksandhobbies.com website. 